It's great to be back on this uh, three-year journey. Uh, note to self, never follow Cheryl. Uh, <laughs> but what I'd like to do is look in our portfolio and tell uh, all of you what we're seeing in terms of the year ahead. And in some ways, the message is similar to what we've seen over the past couple of years. What we're seeing is change. Change is to be expected, but what's unexpected is the nature and speed of that change. Most of us thought change in business was going to look like this. It was Darwinian. It was continuous improvement. In fact, we've gone into a world where change has changed in its very nature. There has been a change in the nature of change. First of all, industries are being remade at a rapid pace, punctuated equilibrium in the world of business. The record business was radio and records for years. Suddenly, it goes through a change and emerges as Spotify and touring. And the rate of change, always fast, has somehow become this snowball that is increasing in speed and size as it rolls down the hill with momentum. So let's jump for a moment into this world of change. The last few years, we talked about a series of uh, things that we were seeing as industries remade themselves, dead malls, the repositioning of malls as experience centers, seatbelts, uh, what Cheryl was talking about. Society was clearly, three years ago, going to put seatbelts on the tech industry. But today, I'd like to go into the other area, not industries being reshaped, but a change in the speed of change. Where are we seeing rapid acceleration? And so I bought a few topics, rap, uh, radical personalization, food fads, subscriptions, the splinter net, places where assumptions we had just a year ago have begun to change. And I'm going to give the talk, I, not the one I want to give, but the one Jason wants to hear. So I'm going to let Jason choose kind of three or four of these and take us into the world of a change in the nature of change. I love this power, Jim. This is really a <laughs> shift. Uh, all right, let's start with SplinterNet. I'll get to why we're using a plug for this. So when the internet went live for commercial use in the early 90s, we developed an idea about it. Definite article, singular noun, the internet. This thing without boundaries, without rules, it could have its own currency, its, its own travel uh, passports. And over those last 30-some years, we've thought about the idea of the internet. We have to ask ourselves if that was wrong, and we're going to operate in a world of the splinter net. Now, what's occurred that has given rise to the acceleration of this idea? A year ago, we were just seeing the beginning of tariffs. We were, most of us hadn't heard of a company called Huawei. And this concept of a dual spear of influence of China and the US was a relatively new idea. Now, we shouldn't be scared by this. If you think back of, over most of history, there's often dual superpowers. We just have to rethink how that might influence our understanding of business. And so in some ways, this is the accelerant to the world of the splinter net. So let's think through how, as investors or business people, we might take that idea into action. There's five things that are on my mind in terms of the world of the splinter net. TAM, 5G, supply chain, software, and business practices. Let me jump into TAM. For those of you who don't speak tech, total available market. And so much of the, dr of the driver of growth in the economy has been the technological marketplaces. If you look back at how people typically talked about the global TAM for technology, a $5 trillion plus market by 2020. Recently, if you look at reports, people are beginning to d express it in a different way. There is a Chinese influenced TAM and a US influenced TAM. On the good news side, together they're larger because there's some friction once you go into two marketplaces. But if you are a company, the TAM for you is at most 60% of what it was a few years ago. So every business plan I get used to assume global dominance. Now we have to think about global dominance being split in half. We're seeing this play out. It wasn't that long ago, 2015, that Cisco and Apple were talking about their largest growth markets, their major investments to be in the Chinese marketplace. Where are they today? Cisco's flat, Apple's down. And it shouldn't surprise us because this has been going on for a while. On the consumer side, you know, Amazon, Google, Uber, each of them assumed they were going to be the dominant player in the Chinese market. 
the world of the splinter net has worked out in a quite different way. Total duality of influence in these two markets. So we have to think about a world where our entire understanding of the TAM of the internet has changed. Now, if this is a Cold War, a tech war of some sort, as uh, some commentators have referred to, the Archduke Ferdinand of that war is 5G. This is uh, what's driving the change. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with 5G, let's let Trevor Noah tell, tell what it is. Technology Trevor will Noah. accelerate and interconnect everything. To download a two-hour film on 3G would take about 26 hours. On 4G, you'd be waiting six minutes. And on 5G, you'll be ready to watch your film in just over three and a half seconds. Damn, you could download an entire movie in three seconds. That's going to be fast. I mean, we'll still spend 45 minutes trying to decide which movie to download. <laughs> but once we've decided, we'll need to go to bed because we're tired. But tomorrow, three seconds, my friends. Now, 5G will be often expressed as speed. But what it is is a total remaking of the internet infrastructure and business model. And in particular, it's going to involve a series of new businesses that will be enabled by the low latency of 5G. This is extraordinarily important. And it happens at a time that uh, the marketplace is remaking market shares. The blue line is essentially the Western market share in global in, uh, internet infrastructure. The lower line is the Asian market share. And what we've seen over time is a closing of market share. And in this product cycle, Huawei was ahead. So this entire market share picture was uh, suddenly at question. And so what's happening? This internet, this single thing, is suddenly becoming uh, the subject of a map. So we have a series of companies that have either banned or are likely to ban Huawei. And we have a series of companies that have committed, a series of countries who have committed to or are likely to commit to Huawei. And then we have a number in between. And so this moment in time is going to dictate a change in the infrastructure of the entire internet and the possibility that it may work differently than what we've seen before. Third thing to think about is supply chain. We are going to have to unscramble this massive omelet called the supply chain. This is a representation of Apple's supply chain, a little out of date, but essentially you get the picture. Um, within the supply chain, a major piece is China with over 300 different suppliers. Already we're seeing moves to move some of that supply chain out of uh, uh, China into other areas. And it's not just Apple. If you look at the Huawei supply chain, it goes deeply into the U.S. And you see Huawei moving to increase its ability to develop its own chips so that it can break the supply chain in its direction. So essentially, this is a massive investment opportunity and a massive challenge. Software is a really interesting area. I would challenge you to name a major enterprise software player in China. So if you begin to think of two tech stacks, software has been one of those areas that the Asia has leaned on the US. But with source code potentially open and with data required to now be uh, stored in China, we may have a total remaking of the software marketplace. And certainly, we have a remaking of the data marketplace. There is a trend going on called a digital nationalization, where data no longer travels freely. Uh, there's about 45 countries around the world that dictate that data for their country is stored in their country, national boundaries being put up on the internet. And the last point, um, as you have national boundaries, you have friction. And so we're going to have to think about our business practices. We assume that business practices would be constant across the internet. Uh, you all know what happened recently to the NBA. You know, a single tweet had you know, huge business implications for the league. And here's a sort of interesting one. Tencent is one of the producers of the new Top Gun movie. And so they are very interested in that movie moving across borders. Maverick is still the star. Maverick still has his jacket. But the patch on the back of the jacket, which used to have a Taiwanese flag, no longer does. Again, changes in how we have to understand business practices in the splinter net. So a few ideas if you're an investor. You're going to go short TAM. TAM is smaller than what people thought. Long cybersecurity, because when you have borders, you want to defend them. Uh, the North American supply chain is going to have to rebuild itself. China application software is likely to grow as an industry. China is going to do its own chip development. And uh, 
here's my favorite one, long compliance personnel. Because as you have two different marketplaces, you're going to have to think about how you cross them. Just a note, and why I use the plug up front, uh, we talk about the internet as the electricity of the 21st century. But we had a dual influence in electricity, Tesla and Edison. And if you just did business models on electricity, you would have assumed we'd have a single system around the world because that would have driven down costs and increased efficiency. Instead, the world we have in the internet of the 20th century is one with multiple plugs, multiple systems dictated by national boundaries. So we have to ask ourselves if the internet, singular, is somehow going to be the splinter net, it might look something more like this. All right, so Jim, let me ask you a question. We see these headlines every day about the negotiations between the US and China. We hear about this decoupling. What I hear you saying is the decoupling is already happening. It's a foregone conclusion. So is that going to at all be dictated by what happens between Trump and Xi at this point? What role will sort of the political and the negotiations between the two countries have on this investment thesis? Well, in course, of course it's important. But at the end of the day, I think, uh, I think the snowball is already yeah. rolling down the hill. If you are thinking about long range planning for your supply chain, if you're thinking about how big your company can be, you're probably as a business person already thinking about the world of a splinter net. I don't think we're going to put that genie back in the bottle, Jason. And so there's no recoupling. I don't even think that's a word, but I'll use it anyway. Well, I, I, you know, we don't know how far apart it will be. Right. So that is, is clearly an open question. But the idea of a single global power or a single global internet without national boundaries, without data protection within uh, individual country limits is uh, probably an old idea. Right. All right. So I want to move on to the next one. And this is something that's on my mind in part because we're going to talk to Jonathan Nelson from Providence Equity a little bit later. We are on the dawn of Disney Plus subscriptions. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many I feel like I have in my house. So let's go there. Uh, this is a major change in how people buy. And it's extraordinary how deep it's become. You know, we used to actually purchase things. We now subscribe. And the implications of this are profound. So first of all, subscriptions have existed for a long time, but they were sort of a backwater of commerce. The first subscription that I found, 1731, Ben Franklin. Books were too expensive, so he put them together. You could subscribe to him. It was the first library. Uh, the first newspaper subscription popped up in the 1830s, The Sun in New York, Penny Papers, 20,000 people subscribed by 1834. It was the beginning of the use of subscription in media. That was where subscriptions were most constant uh, through the early years of the 1900s. Magazines went from 3,000 to 18,000. It was the heyday of Reader's Digest, 30,000 subscribers, until in 1980 it began to tail off. But outside of media, subscriptions were a real backwater. Fruit of the month, right? Columbia Record Club, you had to like write checks and wait for things to show up. Or how about Netflix started, you know, they would actually send you a DVD and you would send it back. Tiny pieces of the marketplace. But what we've seen is a clear change in the amount of share of subscriptions. So why is that? It turns out psychologically on both sides of the market, that subscriptions are an extraordinarily powerful business model. For people, there is a tendency called uh, mental accounting. And we are really poor at mental accounting. We put our money down in a casino, and they give us chips, and we forget that we're actually gambling money. So generally, if you want to push subscriber behavior, you separate the purchase decision from how it's consumed. Uh, subscribers are deep in, in this type of mental accounting. You pay once and then forever, it seems like it's free. People like that feeling. Secondly, we have a flat rate bias. We hate to see a taxi meter tick. That's why Uber gives you the, the fare up front. It feels nervous. How far is it going to go? Do I have enough money? So people will pay more to buy things on a flat rate. All you can eat is often more expensive than buying off the menu, but people like it better. And also, once you have a subscription, there's something called loss aversion. If you have something, it is more painful to take it away. So as people buy subscriptions, they tend to keep them because they 
somehow would suffer loss if they were canceled. On the business side, people love subscriptions because in this world of tech, you can sign people up forever with a double click. So it's become really easy to deliver subscriptions. And one of the things you hate as a business is if someone opts out of one of your product sets. So buying Microsoft 365 as a subscription is really good for Microsoft. And lastly, it turns out the market loves subscription revenue. If you look at what happened when the software business went from package to subscription, the multiple of the software business exploded. Same dollars delivered a different way gets you a higher multiple. So this idea of the two-sided preference for subscriptions, both consumers and businesses, means that the subscription market is exploding. Now, we're familiar with it in terms of content. Pretty much the entire cable stack is being reconstituted as subscriptions. Who would have thought that it wasn't iTunes? It was about streaming and Spotify. Uh, in software, this is SaaS. Right? The movement from package to software as a service has created not only ease of use, but explosion in values. Capital intensive services, whether it's web services, whether it's you can actually now subscribe to Porsche. You can walk into a Porsche dealer and every month or so take out a new car if you want to. And basic consumer, who would have thought you'd buy uh, toothbrushes, toothpaste, toilet paper, coffee by subscription? A fundamental change in behavior. Luxury subscription, you can buy jewels by subscription, makeup by subscription. One of my favorites, Rent the Runway, for uh, essentially about $160 a month, you can get four dresses sent to your closet. You can use them, send them back whenever you want. Why shop anymore when essentially things just show up? Like all things in the internet, it will be overdone. You have beef jerky subscriptions, we have pickle <laughs> subscriptions, we have slime subscriptions. I don't even want a koozie, but you can subscribe to koozies for $7 a month. You get a, set, a special koozie delivered to you every month. And uh, it's a question of, of how far it's going to go. One of the guys working with me sent this, uh, sent this video. See my friends getting loot crates and bark boxes and Dollar Shave Club boxes, and I'm not a geek or a dog owner or a razor blade freak. Where's my box of worthless shit that I can let pile up and then chuck into the dumpster? Introducing Garbage Box. Every month, Garbage Box sends you a box chock full of awesome garbage you won't be able to wait to get your hands on, and then later, throw away. Garbage Box's trained garbage curators take into account your personal garbage style and handpick a slew of trash just for you. If I'm busy, I specify for my garbage box to be delivered directly into my trash. It's perfect. Now, in a, a world where uh, we used to understood what we buy, today 84% of consumers underestimate how much they're spending in, on subscriptions. And in a world where four out of every 10 Americans are challenged to come up with uh, a $400 for a medical emergency, people, the 61% of people are paying massive amounts more per month for subscription than they expect. So there will be a backlash to this. And we're seeing that as there is a plethora of new businesses which are to manage your subscriptions. But if you think about the world ahead, you know, we have to rejigger our entire understanding of how purchase behavior might work. And we have to think about the second order effects of it. Watch the amount of value people will pay for friends or the network. And the reason for that is it's not about who's watching them. It's do they drive subscription purchases? And uh, that's going to change our concept of pain in the year ahead. All right. So, Jim, from an investable perspective, how do you look at things? Because I'm guessing that a lot of those services, maybe not the pickle subscription. And I, I will quibble a little bit because I love koozies. I'm from the South and it's college football <laughs> season. Why, guy, why would Jason. you not want a koozie? But we'll leave that for another time. Um, but I mean, is this something that, how do you put an investment lens on subscriptions? Uh, we're investing in it very aggressively. So we were early investors in Spotify. Uh, we're investors in Calm, which is a subscription uh, app. We're building new subscription media businesses. Uh, we're investors in Ipsy. Uh, so we, you have to analyze subscriptions different. It's about long-term value of customers. It's about CAC. So it's created a, a whole new set of investment metrics. You have to understand the subscription marketplace different than you do the purchase marketplace. But I, I think this is a long-term trend. Yes, there will be a backlash, but uh, the 
sheer dominance of the psychology of subscriptions means they will likely grow in prevalence. And I would imagine some of this is about data, right? I mean, these subscription services collect a huge yeah. amount of uh, data about us. Absolutely. So uh, once you have someone subscribing, uh, you can personalize products for them. You can gather data. And the lifetime value of a customer goes up over time because of the data you can capture about that customer and your ability, therefore, to retain them. So we, we didn't go into that, but there's a whole feedback yeah. loop around subscriptions that are likely to continue their dominance. All right. So next, I want to talk about corporations in the era of and because when I look at that, I'm taken back to business roundtable. This has become a huge issue, it feels like, in your specific business uh, of private equity. So let's go there next. So this is one of the most important questions of the year ahead and probably the decade ahead. We have trillions of dollars of assets in these entities called corporations. And suddenly we're calling into question their purpose what they should and can do. So let me give you an analogy to think about this. I'm a bit of a science wonk. Any of you who are know that one of the interesting trends over time is the debate over the nature of life. 1600s, Newton, Descartes basically decided incontrovertibly that light was a particle. By the 1750s, Maxwell and Young, doing a different set of experiences, proved with the same amount of certainty that life, light had to be a wave. And this debate went on for 150 years until Einstein showed up and uh, uh, came up with a new thought. And uh, the equation was the kinetic energy of a photoelectron is equal to the incident frequency of the light times Planck's constant minus uh, the work function. Not as catchy as E equals mc squared, but essentially that's what he won the Nobel Prize for, the photoelectric effect, the idea of wave-particle duality. What Einstein figured out is it was an and. Light was a particle and a wave. And once science wrapped its head around that, we had a whole new world of discovery and progress. We're going through the same progress and the same sort of path in business. <clears throat> For 40 years, there was this idea of shareholder primacy. Friedman, you know, this, the, the, uh, the, the Uber CEO, and had an idea that wasn't around for the, the history of corporations that if there was extra money around, it should go back to the shareholders. It shouldn't be invested for the future good of the company. It should go back to the shareholders. They owned it. Recently, we've taken a complete right turn on that. And the Business Roundtable came out in a much talked about idea of saying that uh, shareholders are not the only thing, and in fact, not even the prime thing that people should be worrying about. And Jack Welsh, uh, I love this quote, you know, the dumbest idea ever. He was kind of the, the leader of shareholder value, now gone the other way. And so we bear the risk of going guardrail to guardrail, like we always do in business, Jason, where it was all profits, now it's all not profits. I think that we have to go through the same process that we just did in uh, science uh, over centuries, is we have to begin to live in an era of and. Of course you have to have profits or you can't sustain yourself. And of course, you have to take care of your broader ecosystem. We just have to get our head around how to execute that. I've been fascinated by this debate because my entire career has been about governance in a world of ant. So one of the things that really isn't understood, and there's so much that's not understood about private equity, is we are essentially, at our core, a governance system. And I have, for 25 years been co-running one of the largest governance laboratories in the world. Hundreds of companies, hundreds of board seats through the most difficult times, CEO changes, IPOs, transactions of all sorts. We've got it right, we've got it wrong, but we've learned a ton. And our world has always been about and. Why? Because we're long-term investors, and it's been totally clear, even Friedman would agree, that over the long term, you have to take care of your customers or you're not gonna, gonna uh, survive. And our investors have a long time ago asked us to be at the forefront of ESG. So we report on ESG, we train our boards on ESG. And quite frankly, our business is a little more personal. And personally, I have always thought it's the right thing to run a business for AND. It's just the right thing to do. So I've been fascinated as I've watched the rest of the market. So private equity is about 3% of the global equity capital markets. Now the other 97% of the market is coming our way into the world of AND. And I, I had our teams think about this. It turns out there's a massive industry of governance that talking about how corporations are supposed to uh, uh, 
are supposed to conduct themselves. And you can do it all over the world. You can have, you know, scintillating things about board minutes. These are lawyers' sessions taught by lawyers. In fact, uh, a really interesting paper, and Jason, you should get this. It just came out a few weeks ago from Stanford's Rock Center for Corporate Governance. And, and stop for a second and read these quotes. These are people who are governance specialists. They've gone and looked at the field, and what they say is that the concepts are loosely defined and poorly understood. We do not have, after decades of research, an understanding of what makes an effective governance system. And we often misstate the idea of having a staggered board, not having a staggered board, splitting chairmanship. These are just structures. They are not good governance. It would be like saying that if you go on a football field with a formation that you're going to win the game. No, you have to actually play the game. They allow good governance. They are not good governance in themselves. So there's a fundamental break in our understanding of corporate governance at a time we're going to add additional complexity into it. So I'm beginning to speak about this for the first time. It's the first time I've spoke publicly about this because although I've been running the largest governance laboratory, one of the largest governance laboratories out there, uh, we have never been asked to speak at any of those conferences. Uh, I think in finance, there is a place for the theoreticians and there's a place for the practic practical. And uh, Bill Sharp, capital asset pricing model, one of my professors, Warren Buffett, one of the lead investors, you know, you have to balance the two. So let me give you a few comments on the world of AND with the idea of a practitioner's viewpoint entering the discussion. So first of all, uh, four things we have to fix. Shareholder engagement, board dynamics, measurement, and attitude. Shareholder dynamics, somehow there's become a crisis in shareholder involvement in governance. We understand that in a political system, if one person doesn't vote, maybe it doesn't change the system, but if everyone stops participating, the system is gonna break down. That's what's happening in corporate governance. Two things are happening. People are holding shares less, so they are treating their companies like things they're renting, not things they own. And we're seeing the growth of ETFs, which essentially feel a step farther from governance. And so we have a series of really outstanding companies that I respect much that are now having an increasing voice in governance. And so if you think about Vanguard, State Street, BlackRock running the ETF marketplace, this is $15 trillion of investment with 75 people responsible for the governance functions there. Now, why does that feel low to us? It feels low to us because we manage $60 billion of private equity, and we have 160 people on boards actually active in governance. Yes, it's a different model, but 400 times less capital investment. But I feel for State Street, Vanguard, and BlackRock, because they're under massive pressure to decrease their costs. And at the end of the day, the people that invest in these ETFs have to decide whether they want good governance. One last thing about this governance structure. Um, we went into LinkedIn and we found as many of the people at, at these uh, robust institutions that are in the governance business. I think we found 25 or so of the leaders. And what we found is we couldn't find a single board that any of them had sat on. In fact, it's as if the, it's as if people can't coach basketball if you've ever played it. There may be actually rules that say they can't sit on boards. So we don't have the practitioners in the marketplace. Delaware has to step up. So Delaware has set a series of laws that basically are anti-governance in some ways. So if you want to become, and, and I know that's a, a, perhaps a provocative thing to say, um, if you want to become an active owner, essentially you have to tie yourself up in ways that other shareholders uh, don't. So if you're a high-speed trader, you can like just come in town, use the governance structure all you want, never pay for it. If you want to get active, you got to basically tie yourself up. You have short swing profit rules. You have antitrust considerations, et cetera. The deck is stacked against active involvement by shareholders in governance. And secondly, laws often have unintended consequences. The three strikes law in California basically increased violent crime by third time offenders. Revlon, which was a 1985 uh, basically decision about what boards should do at moments of conflict told boards that they should go for process and share price. Process and share price to protect themselves. I don't think Delaware really meant that, but that's what's become common law in our understanding of how boards are supposed to react. Boards have to change how they operate. I've been involved in hundreds of boards. I've sat on 42 uh, major boards myself. And I think it's, it's not that the people on corporate boards are wrong, it's that the boards themselves 
act the wrong ways. So let me give you a couple examples here. Um, I think of a good board like a good dinner party. You bring different people together, you get them talking in the right way, and just wonderful things happen. If you bring a bunch of people that are exactly the same together, it's a reunion. It's not a board meeting. And so if you think about the GE board in 2012, which is, these are extraordinary people. I have massive personal respect for a lot of them. But let's think of them as a dinner party. 14 of the 18 of them are C-suite executives, arguably 15. Three are academics. And there's one investor on the board, but it's actually someone who runs an index fund company, not a direct investor. So really, 15 of 18 are C-suite executives. So what is it about private equity? Um, there's lots of research that show our boards work better. And it's not really about the incentives. If you talk to this board, they believe they were doing the right long-term thing for GE. Let me give you a couple other things to think about. So if I went into our boards compared to public boards. Our boards have more investors. Put investors on boards. The reason for that is I would not want a board of all investors, but nor would I want a board of all managers. There are two different phenotypes. In my experience is when you put them in a room together, good things happen. The dinner party is just more interesting. Secondly, what's the marginal benefit of adding another 60-year-old C-suite executive to a board at, when you already have 14 of them? You know, If you look at the private equity boards, we're essentially 70% under 60. Public boards are essentially 65% over 60. You know, let's bring some different voices into the boardroom. Last thing about public boards versus private boards, in a private board, we are staffed. The people on the GE board, they are staffed in their entire life, but when they walk into a board meeting at GE, you would not have, want to have a dinner party where everyone read exactly the same documents, exactly the same papers before they came to the dinner party. You want people that have a different view, bring a different voice, bring a different perspective into the room. Other thing about boards is we hire for resume. It's a, as if in a, in a football context, we hire people, we hire players based on their 40 time. There is a way to play the game. And I found over sitting in, you know, Malcolm Gadwell says 10,000 hours make you an expert. I counted up the other day, I've done 15,000 hours of board meetings. And uh, you know, there are skills about critical listening. You can have respect without deference. And, and when we look for people on the board, we look for them with these skills. And quite frankly, boards are horribly run. The time value of money. I, I've been in so many boards where huge amounts of times are wasted. The GC talks all the time. Basically, uh, we added up. We think for a major board, it's about $250,000 an hour. If you look at all the people sitting in the room, to how they traveled, they traveled in, $250,000 an hour, are we using that time well? So we can change board dynamics. Next thing we've got to do, we have to decide, if we're going to live in the world of and, what does and mean? How are we going to measure this concept of doing the right thing? And we are nowhere on this. So uh, this, this shocked me. Um, two organizations, I think a lot of the, uh, the FT, uh, F, FTSE and MSCI, each have done a huge amount of work to measure basically this idea of social responsibility. Huge amount of work. They put out indices. Now, if we had an agreement as to what social responsibility was, the dots and graph of companies would basically fall on that line, right? We would be agreeing, both of these organizations, as to what social responsibility would be. This is the, the scatter plot of how each of these two robust organizations measure social responsibility. So we're making progress on this since 2011. SASB has been uh, active on this, the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures. There's a number of stakeholder initiatives to try to get at this. There's a number of media initiatives to try to get at it. In fact, recently they announced an initiative to coordinate the initiatives. That's a two-year initiative. So we can basically put people on the moon in 10 years. We do not have 10 years if we're going to live in the world of and to come up with how we are going to measure this. So we have to accelerate it. Final point, this is ultimately not just a societal issue, it's a leadership issue. And uh, I am glad to see leaders stepping forward to talk about this, but ultimately we've been measured not by what we say, but by our action. So I told you that we've lived in the world of and for a while. Let me take you into that and how we as TPG have committed to this. 
So first of all, we decided a number of years ago that we were going to be active politically. So when we left the Paris Climate Accords, we signed up as a country, we signed up as TPG to be in. We've been active in LGBTQ uh, rights. We've been active when the DACA, uh, when we needed to, to support DACA, we went into our portfolio, 500,000 employees, and we offered to pay for anyone who needed to apply for DACA. So as a company, one of the changes is traditionally companies stayed out of politics, stayed out of, of social issues. We are going to have to stand up for who we are. You are going to have to declare your positions. Secondly, we at TPG believe in growth. At the end of the day, we need to support growth. So this is something that's not understood about our industry. You know, we drive job creation and we have skewed our investing towards situations that that's true. We also take on individual issues. So we're asking ourselves, you know, what can we do to drive change? One thing we did is we realized we have a lot of board seats. One of the issues in the economy is how do you get more gender diversity into boards? How do people get their first board? So we went out starting two years ago and we basically set ourselves a goal of putting 100 women on our boards. We're at 58, as actually 59 as of yesterday. We're gonna make it to 100. This isn't an, an issue we can affect. Other companies will have other issues, but each company is going to have to declare what they're gonna do, not just to check the box, but to drive change. And one last point, we're an investment firm. So we uh, have decided to engage in this issue by being the leader in impact investing. So four years ago, we launched something called the Rise Fund. It's now a $5 billion platform spanning 35 different countries, companies around the world. And what we're trying to do is identify, shine a light on, and support companies that from their beginning live in the world of AND. Let me just give you a picture into this just so you understand the type of companies that we're seeing. We invest in Dreambox Learning. It's a digital education solution, 3 million students driving math uh, progress 60% farther in a year with 45 minutes a week of use. We're involved in Allergene, which is a lower cost cancer medicine company. EverFi, this is the number one provider of anti-bullying software, anti-harassment software, anti-alcohol abuse software around the country. We protect 8 million acres in Africa through wilderness safari companies. We serve 247,000 families in uh, India with um, access to marketplace through Dola Dairy. We help 200,000 uh, students here in the US save through Acorns. We provide uh, millions of, um, of tons of carbon sequestration through solar in India. We save lives by delivering blood by drone in Rwanda and Uganda. Uganda. We connect 40 million people in Africa into the financial system for the first time. We drive 15,000 students to degrees without, without student debt. We change seizure medication. We reduce carbon through uh, savings programs uh, around the country. We basically are driving the first digital national bank. We have changed the protein picture in Uganda and Kenya through a company called Pearl Dairy. We have provided financial inclusion in the rural villages of China through CD Finance. We are changing tech skills in Argentina, Argentina and Brazil through Digital House. And Evercare, our platform, serves 2 million patients through 23 hospitals in India, 11 clinics in Pakistan. We're building the first new hospital in Nigeria in 10 years. So this is what we're doing. And this is what corporations everywhere have to decide what they can do. And so the world of AND is one that is um, challenging. We're going to have to change our understanding of what a corporation is. We're going to have to change our understanding of governance. But as the Edelman Trust Barometer tells us, there is an opportunity for business to step forward and build trust. And uh, you know, that, I think, is the opportunity we need to focus on as we sort out the world of AND. Jim Coulter, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I wanted to get uh, into a few more things, but you'll just have to come back next year when you're going to have a whole new set of ideas. Thank you so we'll much. You Thank year. you, everyone. <laughs>